Hi, this is Natalie. Thank you for listening to Crossroads Church, where we are bringing a real God to real people. I believe you'll be inspired by today's message. Hey, good morning. How is everybody? Uh, y'all are looking good out there. I'm Joel. I'm the teaching guy here. Honored to serve under our senior pastor, Marcus, the guy that was just up here, Marcus and Natalie Avalos. We're continuing our series today called Summer of Joy. We have been going through the book of Philippians, verse by verse. Philippians is called the book of joy because it was written from a prison cell. And Paul is telling you basically, guys, it doesn't matter what the environment around you looks like. You can have joy and peace and confidence and hope because that all starts from the inside. Regardless of how bad things look outside, it starts on the inside. Today, I want to talk about something that I really believe is the number one problem in the church today. And if we could resolve this issue, it literally could resolve every problem the church has. If we could just remove this one thing. So I've been hanging out in the church for 47 years, um, seen a lot of stuff. People are like, my wife's always like, you're only 46. How are you, why do you say 47? I'm like, well, my dad and mom, they're both, my dad was a pastor. And so I was basically born on the front row of a church. So I count that nine months I was in my mom's belly as an extra year. So I've seen a lot of stuff, y'all, 47 years in the church. And this one thing that we're going to talk about today, if we could get rid of it, it would solve everything in the church. Do you know what the number one problem is with the church? It's people. You know what else is a big problem in the church? Pastors. They're horrible. They're horrible. Of course, I'm joking. Without people, we wouldn't have a church. And in fact, the church isn't this building. The church is people. But have you ever noticed that people be crazy? <laughs> Seriously. Like, so I, I had a friend that he was going to this church during COVID. And uh, the pastor of the church, he had some issues with his health. So he closed the church down and he's like, look, we're going to do everything by live stream. You guys remember that early days of COVID. We didn't know what we were dealing with. So we shut down the church, started doing everything by video. Well, my friend, he decided he was like, I don't like watching church by myself in my house. So he started inviting friends over on Sunday morning to his house to watch the, the service. So a lot of people started coming. So the pastor calls him up. He's like, you can't do that. And he's like, well, why? He's like, you're starting your own church. And my friend's like, what? I don't, we're watching the video of you preaching. It's just people from the church. He's like, yeah, but you're starting your own church. That's an unsanctioned church service. So they like, called him in before the board and they told him he can't do that. And anyways, they stay, keep the church shut down. Well, a few weeks later, that same pastor, again, pastors be crazy, y'all. That same pastor finds out that a bunch of people from his church have started going to this other Baptist church in town because they opened. They were like, ah, we can keep open. We can keep people safe. So he calls up all his church members. He's like, you can't go to those other churches. Like, why? He's like, because you're a member of our church. And it caused this big division and split over this. And I'll tell you what, if you've ever been involved in conflict in a church, church people are the worst sometimes. Do you know why? Because we are all convinced God is on our side. <laughs> you're wrong. Jesus is with me. No, no, Jesus is with me and you're wrong. Right? We all want Jesus to be on our side. And we all think God has told us what we're supposed to do, and we know exactly what we're going to do. And listen, I do believe God speaks, but you know, one of the biggest things that happens a lot of times in Bible schools is you'll have guys, and they'll go up to girls, and this is the hottest, like, this is the, this is the pickup line at Bible schools. Hey, I think God told me to marry you. <laughs> and the girl's like, I didn't hear that. <laughs> yeah, well, you know. You'll, you'll see eventually, you know, I fell from heaven, right? So we've, 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 here's the crazy thing about it. So Proverbs 22, one, verse 1, it says this. It says, every person's way seems right in their own eyes, but it's God who tests the heart. Do you know everything you believe is right to you? You're convinced it's right. Otherwise, you would have already changed your mind. And do you know everything I believe? Y'all know this. It's right in my mind. But sometimes what you believe is right versus what I believe is right is completely different. And that's where we come into conflict. And conflict is no joke because we've all got our opinion about how things should be. And we look at everybody else and go, what's their deal? Right? You got your ex. He, he calls you and every time you get off the phone with him, you go, what is his deal? 
Like, is, his, does, is he just determined to make my life horrible? Is that his new thing? I'm just going to make his life horrible? And you have all disagreements about the kids and stuff, and you're just like, what is his deal? And you have somebody that you probably work with. You're dreading going to see them tomorrow. You avoid them in the hall. You go into work as late as possible. You figure out when they arrive at the parking lot so you can not arrive at the same time because everything y'all do is so opposite. And every, you'll propose something at work, and, and it seems like just out of spite, they'll propose the opposite thing. Now, I don't think your idea is going to work. You're like oil and water. Maybe you have a boss that's like that. And you're like, what, what's his deal? Why can't we get together on anything? And there's all this conflict we have. Maybe it's with your spouse. You have this one thing and you're just like, what is her deal? Why does she get so insecure about certain stuff? Like, she, that one thing comes up and she gets super insecure, whether it's about her family or, you know, looks or whatever it is. And you're like, what's her deal? And we've all got these things where we think we're okay, but they're the ones with the deal. Right? So Paul, he addresses this in Philippians 4. He starts off the chapter, um, and, and, and he says this. Remember last week we talked about the importance of who you surround yourself with? Because like Paul says this, he says, don't, don't be a fool. Basically, bad company corrupts good character. You've got to be really careful who you're hanging around with because you're going to become like those people you hang around with. And then he goes on and says this. Therefore, my brothers and sisters, you whom I love and long for, my joy and crown, stand firm in the Lord in this way, dear friends. And then he says something interesting. He says, I plead with Yudia and I plead with Syntyche to be of the same mind in the Lord. He says, another translation says, to get along in the Lord. Apparently, they're having a major conflict. And he even asks the guy he's writing the letter to, he says, I ask you, my true companion, help these women, basically, help them work out their situation, because they've contended at my side in the cause of the gospel, along with Clement and the rest of my coworkers whose names are in the book of life. He says, man, these ladies, I love them. They have been a huge blessing in the church. But apparently, this conflict between these ladies was so major and serious that word got back to Paul, who at the time was on the other side of the world. Not really, but he was in the Medi on the other side of the Mediterranean, which at the time was the other side of the world. The conflict had gotten so bad between these two wonderful, godly women that Paul heard about it. And he's like, guys, you got to work out your differences. So these two women have this major conflict. And I was trying to figure out what is the conflict they had. And I did all these research on Bible commentaries. Finally, I realized, you know what? I'm just going to go back to the original source and try and figure out what the conflict was. So I pulled up some of these ladies' old tweets. And what I found was super enlightening. Check this out. Syntyche, man, she goes off. Y'all, I can't even. Frowny face, frowny face. Some people at my church are such hypocrites. How can they even call themselves Christians? She was ticked. Look at this, hashtag be loving. And then this one's really a slap. Wait till Paul finds out, hashtag. <laughs> but it even got worse. When check out who pipes in and responds. Yudi is like, seriously, if I treated people the way some Christians do, I couldn't live with myself. I mean, when your name starts with sin, what you expect? <laughs> Ouch, that's like below the belt, y'all. Hashtag sinners with a Y, sinners, that's wrong. It got ugly. Now, just to be clear, um, this isn't real. These are not actual tweets from the actual characters. Um, I made all that up. But my point was, I wanted to show you that conflict is nothing new. But the way conflict has shown up has morphed a little bit in our world, doesn't it? But there's always going to be conflict. And the way we can communicate our conflict shows up differently. But these ladies, apparently, they had a major disagreement. And Paul's like, guys, you've got to figure out a way to come together in the Lord. And he lays out exactly how to do that, I believe, but it can get lost because of the chapter markers in the Bible. So when, this, when the Bible was written, there were no chapter markers or verse markers. We added those later, translators trying to help us kind of get the Bible a little bit, like a little more uh, easy to, to, to go through it and to reference sections of the Bible. But in the original, there was no markers. So what you see is you, you look at chapter four, chapter four is how it starts like this and you think, oh, it must be a new thought. It's not a new thought. It's the sequence of thought. So what we actually have to do is go back to chapters three verses 20 and 21 and see what Paul was talking about. And he actually references that because remember here he says there, therefore, my brothers and sisters, the, the verse we just read, you whom I love and long for my joy, my crown, stand firm in the Lord in this way. You go, wait, what way? We already explained what way. 
And it's back in 320, something we covered last week, but we brushed past it. He says this, but guys, our citizenship is in heaven. And we eagerly await a savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ, who by the power that enables him to bring everything under his control will transform our lowly bodies so that they will be like his glorious body. Now, what he's saying here would have been very clear to the Philippians, but we, don't, we may not catch it unless we understand a little context. Philippi was a very fascinating city. It was actually considered a little Rome. The people that lived in Philippi, were, it was populated by former Roman, Roman legion soldiers who had won a battle. And Rome said, look, you guys, you're never coming back to Rome. You're Romans. You've got all the rights and privileges of Romans, but you're setting up a little Rome way over here. Rome's over here, but you're setting up a little Rome right over here in what we would call modern day Greece. So they got this. He's like, guys, your citizenship it's in heaven. And what they understood is, yeah, it's like our citizenship. We're Romans, but we're not made for Rome. We're made to occupy this space right here. And I think what Paul is saying is pretty powerful because here's the reality of it. All indications in the Bible is that when Jesus comes and he he sets up his kingdom on earth, he's not going to swoop us off to heaven and we're all going to be strumming harps. The Bible indicates that we're going to rule and reign with him on a new heaven and a new earth. That's what Paul is saying here. He says, when by the power that enables us to bring everything under his control, will transform our lowly bodies so they will be like his glorious body. You're going to get a brand new body. Thank God. Some of us are like, oh, I can't wait till the back pain goes away, right? You're going to be ruling and reigning a new heaven and a new earth. You're not going to be up in heaven strumming a harp because you weren't made for heaven. You're a kingdom, a citizen of heaven, but you're made for earth. And our job on the earth is this, to spread the glory of Jesus Christ across the earth. And we are Christ's ambassadors, Paul says in another version. And that's a whole different way of thinking of things. Because oftentimes we think that God's just going to swoop us up to heaven and we're going to be, oh, I'm back where I'm meant to be. No, that's not how it's going to work. He's going to come down. He's going to set everything right. And then he's going to give each one of us a job to help rule and reign with him over this new world, this imperfect, it's a perfect place to live. So that changes everything. But what he's saying is you already have that citizenship right now. So you already have a right and you get the rights and the responsibilities of a citizen of heaven right here on earth. And that changes everything. He's saying, guys, right now you have all the rights. You have all the privileges. Like Pastor Marcus just read a second ago, all the benefits of being a citizen of heaven. But we're still called to live on this earth. And that's where things get complicated. Because we can rejoice in our, oh, I'm a citizen of heaven. Oh, I love heaven, heaven. And then we got to go and work tomorrow next to that person. Or we got to drive home next to that person. And the conflict that y'all put aside to come to church and look all happy is going to come back up. (laughs) The conflict is there. And we go, well, what do we do? And and I think Paul, he's saying the key is realizing that your citizenship is in heaven. You live here, but your citizen's over there. And, And there's this really encouraging story where Paul actually has a conflict with somebody, I think it's really encouraging because it says, hey, Paul, the dude that wrote the Bible actually had a conflict with somebody and they couldn't come to an agreement on it. So there's a story in Acts. It says, now Barnabas wanted to take with them John, called Mark, John Mark, they called him. But Paul thought best not to take with them one who had withdrawn from them in Pamphylia and had not gone with them to the work. And there arose a sharp disagreement. Some, one said, I think one person says a bitter disagreement so that they separated from each other. So here's here's what's happening. This guy, John Mark, he was was on a trip, a missionary trip with with Paul and with Barnabas, but John's like, I gotta go. And and Paul was very offended by it. He was upset by this. Well, Barnabas is like, we need to give him, you know, another chance. And Paul's like, nah, no soup for you. You're out of the club. (laughs) It actually kind of reminds me of kind of the difference between Pastor Marcus and me. Like, so Barnabas actually means son of encouragement. So you can imagine he was probably somebody who just saw the potential of people and he was like, man, I'm going to stick with them over and over again. I think about that. That's like the difference between Pastor Marcus and me. Pastor Marcus is willing to give people chance after chance after chance. All right. <laughs> so this conflict arises and they can't come to an agreement. So they actually end up parting ways. But what's encouraging about this is they, Paul says, no, nope, I can't do that. But we're still on the same mission. So our agreement is going to be You're going to do your thing, I'm going to do mine, and we're going to stay unified in Christ because the most important thing is spreading God's glory and his message to the world around us. We can disagree on stuff. We have to stay united in that. 
but we're going to go our separate ways. And I think that's what was in his mind when Paul wrote this in Romans, which is a really encouraging verse. He says, if it's possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. What he's saying is, there are going to be some situations where it may not be possible to live at peace with everybody because your disagreements are so sharp and so divided and so different. But you have to learn to live at peace with each other. And this, this can, I mean, we, we have this in our world today where you've got so, interpersonal relationships. We've got political divides that are so sharp that we go, I literally can't get on board with that anymore. I, like the parties used to be, you know, a little bit more mellow than they are today, but now everything is so rigid. I mean, they, the guy they just, again, I'm not trying to get political, but I want to make a point here. The guy they just elected to be the vice president on the Democratic Party, the Democratic Party chose a guy who was a governor over a state that said, we'll transgender the kids, we'll let them mutilate their bodies permanently and take hormones that will not ever be taken back. It'll mess them up permanently before they even get out of puberty and even know what they really are and really believe. And I, that's, Jesus talked about that. He said, if you ever cause a child to stumble he, go, he goes mafia, Jesus does. He's like, it'd be better if we hung a millstone around your neck and dropped you to the bottom of the Hudson. That's not what he says. But he says, it'd be better if we drop you to the bottom of the ocean. But he, it's kind of mafia. He gets serious about it. He's like, you don't, you protect children until they're able to make their own decisions. And he gets bitter about it, right? Like, they're serious about it. And there's certain things where I look at that and I go, I cannot in any way vote for that. And I cannot, I don't know that a, a believer in, that has a morality can, in, can vote for that, but that's become a major party ticket, right? And I go, I'm going to love those people, but I think it's completely and totally wrong, but I'm still going to try and find a peace, way to live at peace with them. And that's where it gets really tricky because there are some people that you're just like, I cannot agree with anything they say or do. And I think it's actually morally wrong what they do, but I've still got to find a way to live at peace with them. This also means that there are some relationships in life you may never get closure on. You want them to say they're wrong, they may never say they're wrong. And you, as much as you're responsible, you may have to be the one that apologizes, but you never get an apology from them. You're like, I'm sorry. And they're like, yeah, I know you are. <laughs> and you go, but, but no, as best as it's possible, you as a Christian, as a kingdom member from the citizen of heaven, you go... I just am not going to get closure on this. I had to come to terms with that several times in my life. Where I'm like, they, what they did was so wrong, but they didn't ever apologize. But I apologized for my part in it. And as best as I could, I try and live at peace with them. Now, do we walk the same path anymore? No, like Paul and Barnabas, we've gone separate ways. I don't question their salvation, but I say, I can't stand with that. But I hold on to what I believe the Holy Spirit is guiding me as, 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 as the, the, what I'm supposed to be doing. And again, there are some moral issues. I don't think there's any gray room on them. There's just no gray room on mutilating children in my mind. And I think the Bible is clear about that. There's no gray room in that, but I still have to learn to live at peace with those people. And this is the trench warfare every day. So here's the question I want to close with. We've got all these people that have different beliefs. How do we res resolve our differences? And the honest truth is I don't exactly know how, but I do know what's not going to work. We will never resolve our differences online. I know that you're convinced that you're going to make the post that changes the world. <laughs> if I just say what's on my mind, I got to, I, I can't even, I got to say this. And everybody's going to go, oh, you're so right. Thank you. We repent in dust and ashes. No, <laughs> it's not going to happen. It's not going to happen online. It's only going to happen in interpersonal relationship, which is why guarding the relationship and unity is so important. And this also means this, when there is a conflict and disagreement, it's not going to happen because you blasted them with truth. You must use minimum necessary force because here's the thing. You may vanquish your foe with your truth that you say the Bible says this, and you may be absolutely right. But people who have been conquered don't usually like to hang out with the ones who conquered them. You may win the battle, but you lost the relationship. And this is where you use minimum necessary force. And you see the goal here is to live at peace with everyone. And I can destroy them, but they may not want to hang around with me anymore. And then I've lost the relationship and I have no ability to change their mind. And here's the really important thing, guys. People are not the enemy. The Bible says we wrestle not against flesh and blood. We wrestle against principalities and powers in high places. It's the mindsets that are really tainting our, ourselves. It's the diabolical. It's literally diabolical from the devil. Many of the mindsets we have that we're saying are good. They're actually from the devil. But you're never going to conquer it by just crushing a person. It's only by gently walking with them and saying, hey, here's, 
here's where I believe about this, and I really believe this is what God says about it, and you do it in a loving way with minimum necessary force. Standing your ground, but not to the point where you're crushing your enemy because those who have been crushed don't like to hang out with those who crushed them. And here's my, here's my pro tip. If there is one piece of advice I can give you on how to do this right, this is my inspirational card. This is my Hallmark card. Y'all ready for this? Imagine this on a Hallmark card. Aim low. <laughs> when you can't find agreement with anybody, find the lowest common point of agreement and start from there. That person at work that you just go, man, I think they're literally intentionally trying to cause conflict by opposing everything I say. Find a common point of agreement. Hey, do you like tacos? <laughs> Me too. Let's go to tacos. And then you pay the bill. Let them eat as many tacos as they want. And then see where the conversation goes from there because you found your common point of agreement. Your ex, who's just determined to make your life hell, you're absolutely convinced, come to this common agreement. I really want the best for our kids, and I, I think you do too. Yeah, I do want the best for our kids. Start there. And then you build slowly from there, finding common ground together because the goal is as best as it's possible within your ability. Live at peace with everyone. And there are some things you just can't compromise on, but we still have to live at peace. And the most important thing, guys, we as a body of Christ, we got to get on the same page. Because if we can't even show unity in the house here, how are the people around us who don't even have the same core values and aren't even citizens of heaven yet are going to get on the same? We're, our goal is to let our light shine before men that they may see our good works and glorify our Father in heaven. It's only going to happen as we choose to get along, even in spite of our differences, show love and figure out how do we live at peace with one another. And Paul says it's really important. Do you guys receive that? Let me pray for you. Father, we thank you that you are the Prince of Peace. And Lord, I just pray that we would all humbly acknowledge we don't have the total corner on everything. You've given us enough truth that we can put, hang our hat on, true things. But I pray, Lord, that we would be people of conviction in this world of lies, but also people who are loving. We're known more for our love than anything else. They will know we are Christians by our love, it says. So Lord, we just thank you um, that you are the one who's gonna bring peace. And we thank you, Lord, that as we stay focused on you, we may have disagreements, but as we stay focused on you, the mission will move forward with a central unified focus. If you're here this morning and you've not given your life to Jesus, that's the first step. You gotta get your life right with him. And when you ask for forgiveness of your sins, he will come and he will transfer you out of the kingdom of darkness and he will set you up with him in eternity in the kingdom of light. And it starts when we acknowledge our need for him. I'm gonna say a prayer in just a second. If you say this prayer and mean it in your heart, God is gonna come and forgive your sins and set you up with him. Let's all say this prayer together. Lord Jesus, we repent of our sin. We turn from our way and we turn to your way. Help us walk in your truth. Amen. Hey, if you just said that prayer, welcome to the kingdom of God. We got some resources for you there under that do it again sign. Man, I pray that y'all will be peacemakers this week, speaking the truth, but seeking peace in everything you do. Be blessed. You're dismissed. If you are ever in the Seguin area, come visit us on Sunday mornings at 9 or 11 a.m. Or you can just download our app and receive our weekly messages right to your phone. Just text CC Seguin to 77977 and click on the link that you receive. May the remainder of your week be enriched with God's favor and blessings.